Well, after the House overwhelmingly passed the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act last week, it was not surprising to see many on the left attack the bill. Given the anti-Semitic rhetoric and violence we've seen on college campuses since October the 7th, but the legislation has also drawn conservative critics as well. Some have claimed that the bill violates the First Amendment, threatening free speech. Even more concerning is that there are suggestions that this legislation would make the message of the gospel illegal. Well, what's behind these accusations? This is not the first time we've seen this language. In fact, President Donald Trump in December of 2019 actually put forward this same language as an executive order across the entire federal government. Well, breaking this down with us today is David Bernstein. He's a professor at the Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason University and recently published an article at National Review Online with the headline, What People Are Getting Wrong About the House Anti-Semitism Bill. Professor, welcome to Washington Watch. Thanks so much for uh, joining us. Uh, thanks so much for having me. So describe the text of this legislation, what it would do and what it would not do. Well, the first thing, which is the most important thing about the law, is that it would ensure that Jews are protected from discrimination on campus. When Congress passed the 64 Civil Rights Act, it excluded religion from protections to protect religious schools. And until the Bush administration, uh, the position of the government was that Jews are religious groups that are not protected, but in, since then, every administration has agreed that Jews are protected as an ethnic group from ethnic discrimination, and this law would codify that, make it into the law. So that's the uncontroversial part. The controversial part is that it says that when a Jewish student uh, sues for a university for discrimination, when determining whether the discrimination in question was, that's alleged was, in fact, discrimination, or there was just a coincidence or something else happened, that uh, the Office of Civil Rights can, may, use a definition called the International Holocaust Remembers Lines Definition of Anti-Semitism uh, in determining whether someone was engaged in discriminatory intent. And one example that is given in the definition is that um, traditional Christian uh, doctrine that has been used for anti-Semitic purposes, if it's used to being criticized, uh, is it, if it's being used to criticize Israel, may be anti-Semitic. And it's that's all it says. Uh, that's exactly what everyone's already doing. It just makes it into the law. Uh, and let me give you an example of what sort of thing this would actually affect. Imagine someone says, you know, it's no, it's no wonder the Jews are murdering Palestinians left and right. After all, they killed Christ, right? I don't think anyone would doubt that that might very well be an anti-Semitic statement. It doesn't ban people from preaching the gospel. It doesn't even ban people from saying Jews killed Jesus. It doesn't ban people from criticizing Israel however they want. It only says that if we're trying to determine whether someone made an action that looks like it was discriminatory, if they also were making statements at the same time, those statements might be usable for discriminatory intent. Well, I, I may get to that in a moment from a theological standpoint, but I want to step back for just a moment. This is the identical language that was in the executive order that was promulgated by President Trump. It makes reference to this international standard that about a thousand different government entities actually use. So this is not like it's a new definition of anti-Semitism. And the example that you just used is about one of 15 that the International Holocaust Remembrance uh, uh, um, Association um, puts forth. So this is not new, am I correct? You're absolutely correct. And for those of your viewers who've seen people alleging crazy things like you won't be able to read the Bible, it's going to make the New Testament illegal, you're not going to be able to uh, talk about Jesus' death, this is already the rule. This is already applied in the federal government, in the educational context, in 30 states, in most of the major cities in the United States. <clears throat> and all it does is take a rule that's already has been implemented throughout the United States and applies it 
it says, okay, we're not just implementing this from an administrative point of view, which could be reversed at any time, we're making it part of the law. So it's really, uh, if, you, if you're able to, whatever you're able to do right now, whatever you're legally able to do, you will still be able to to do it if this law passes. Uh, Professor, one other place that's been utilized, the State Department has actually had this definition, um, I think since uh, 2016, if I'm not mistaken. But let me ask you this question, Professor. Have there been any cases since this definition has been utilized where we've seen someone that has been making reference to the gospel or someone's free speech has been violated? Uh, there are no, certainly no cases involving uh, the gospel. Uh, I think one, thing, one background thing we should understand is that unlike in the United States, in Europe, it's been very common to do things like around Christmas time, have cartoons that say, they killed him with a capital H, and now they're killing them, and show like a bloodthirsty Israeli murdering a Palestinian child. But, so but there is. L let me let me stop you there because that's a reference to modern day Israel. Yes, and but that's what but this and that's they, what this applies to. This does not apply to the the reading of the scripture that you, you would say that the and I'm going to get here into the theological in a moment, but to say the Jews in the Bible were responsible for the death of Christ, that is not what is covered under this uh, provision, under this definition. No, it's very specifically about using things that happened or, or thought to have happened or some people believe happened 2,000 years ago to criticize the state the of Israel. The modern state of today. Israel. Right. Right. So from a theological standpoint, as a Bible-believing Christian the way we see this is that Jesus Christ wasn't, his life wasn't taken from him. He laid down his life, but his life was given for the sins of all mankind. Uh, and so we are the ones responsible for his death. Our sins um, was what required his death and sacrificial death on the cross. So that's, that is a biblical holding of what happened in Scripture. Uh, that is, to, to history has shown us, though, that there are those who have an anti-Semitic, um, I don't want to say leaning, but a, a drive, try, try to blame the Jewish people for the death of Christ. And that is, yes, when it's coming from a place of anti-Semitism, that's what this is talking about. Yes, but I just want to caution that even then, this bill does not, I mean, I, you know, obviously I'm, I'm not Jew, I'm Jewish, so I'm not going to get into inter-Christian debates about uh, the New Testament, but even if someone took the most anti-Semitic possible reading of the Gospels and preached that in his church, this law does not threaten his or her ability to do that. It's only if they engage in some other anti-Semitic action, like they run a large business, they happen to be a Christian, uh, and they denied someone a job, uh, and that person says, well, you know, I will, of course I wouldn't hire that guy, he's a Christ killer. Yes, that's a reference to something in the New Testament, but that could be used, not the statement that you think Jews are Christ killers, that's lawful, but if the question is, did you not hire this person because he was Jewish, or is it just that there were better employees, the fact that you called him a Christ killer would be evidence of discriminatory intent. But, that, but even that itself is going to end up in court. I mean, that's what's going to end up happening with, with, with that. But this, this is designed to address not beliefs, but actions. That. Correct, and it's not a criminal law. So people who say, "Oh, people can go to jail for preaching the Bible," it's, it's only for civil actions, only for evidentiary purposes. So there's been a lot of exaggeration. Uh, I'm not sure the people who are saying this have actually read the bill. I don't know what their motivations are, but what? I've I don't know if I've ever seen so much distortion over such something that's really so inconsequential in the sense it doesn't change what's already well, the, the law, basically. Well, Professor Bernstein, that's, my, that's kind of my, my next question. Is well then. There was no, you know, dust up in 2019. In fact, I was uh, the, the chairman of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Now, we didn't focus on U.S. Uh, policy, but we focused internationally. And I, one of my last uh, hearings that I chaired under the Trump administration was on anti-Semitism in Europe. And, and, and that was a part of this executive order. 
that the, the president executed to deal with this issue in the United States across the federal government. There was no controversy. There was no, nothing was said like what we're hearing today. So, so why is it a problem now that this, the Congress has taken action to codify the provisions of this into law? Well, look, I'm not an, an expert on uh, domestic politics, but it does seem obvious to me that there are certain media figures, uh, I can name names if you want, but who have decided that part of their audience is uh, the fringe right-wing anti-Semitic group that's always been out there, but has generally, you know, for a long time, the conservative movement was very firm about keeping the people out. And there are some people who are entrepreneurial who said, you know, there's always the, there is this frat faction of uh, the American right that's always been kind of suspicious of Jews, and we're going to uh, play them to get our clicks, to get our viewers. Uh, if Fox News won't put me on, I'll just appeal to the more fringy people. You know, I, I may take you beyond where you want to go, Professor, but you're a professor of law, so you can't really avoid politics. But could it also be that the, the landscape of America has changed in the last four years, where there is a lot of people don't trust government. There's no confidence that the government is going to operate from a standard of justice. And so there's this fear now that any power given to the government, we, we read into, and there's an element that reads the worst into it. I think that's right. I think there's uh, increased suspicion and paranoia. Sometimes, you know, some of it's not completely unjustified, frankly, because uh, the government does misbehave. Um, and, you know, there are also abuses of some of these civil rights laws where we know that there are people who have said relatively innocuous things, who then get brought up on charges on campuses uh, or sometimes lose their jobs. Uh, and that's a fear. And that fear uh, is not completely unreasonable for anti-Semitism as well, that people could uh, be uh, fired or punished uh, unreasonably. But that's not really what this, that's a real problem with what we call hostile environment law, that hostile environment law could be used to suppress speech. But like I said, that's this bill doesn't change the way things are right now. It doesn't add anything to what hostile environment law currently says. There are problems with overreach uh, in enforcing some of uh, these types of laws, but that is really not at all specific to this legislation, which doesn't really move the ball at all. It just codifies what's already in place. And I'm all in favor of uh, reconsidering whether some the scope of some of our civil rights laws go too far. Uh, but uh, I'm not really in favor of saying, well, everyone, you know, we're going to sing out Jews and say we can't protect Jews from anti-Semitism, but other groups uh, do get protection from discrimination in the same context. That said, uh, Professor, do you see anything in the House version of legislation, which now is going, the Senate's going to take it up and I assume may take it up this week. I've been talking to some of the sponsors over there. I is there anything that can be addressed in the, the present language that could address the concerns that are out there? The only thing I can really think of is that one thing I don't think we've even mentioned in this discussion, all those 15 or so examples of anti-Semitism that are provided in the definition, the, IHR, the IHRA definition, they're all given as things that could in context be construed as anti-Semitic. In other words, I'm not saying that any time anyone says something like Israel should never should not exist, Jews don't deserve a homeland. They're not saying that's always anti-Semitic. They're saying in context, in a particular context, you could potentially use that as evidence of, of discriminatory intent. So and I have to say some advocates on the other side who favor this also miss that nuance sometimes. And they say, well, you said it's anti-Semitic. So I think they could potentially uh, clarify that uh, none of these um, None of these examples are definitive. Uh, and they could also clarify that no one's going to be punished. I mean, it does say that no First Amendment rights will be violated. Right. But they could, I think, add something to the effect that no one will be punished simply for saying one of these things. It's only, again, they could, I mean, it's all in the bill. But I suppose you could make the language clearer and bolder so that uh, it's much harder to miss and uh, make, make the emphasis there. Okay. Uh, but I, th I don't think the bill is really that ambiguous. So Professor, I, I think it's fine. we're, we're yeah. going to have to leave it there. Class is over. But I want to thank you for joining us and uh, being on Washington Watch today.